Most people have the impression that God drove Adam and Eve out of his presence when he drove them out of the garden. But on today's program, I'm going to show you that that's not true, that the presence of God was still with man, and it was Cain who left the presence of God. This is going to help you, so stay tuned for the Gospel Truth. Welcome to Gospel Truth with Andrew Womack, a teaching ministry that emphasizes God's unconditional love and grace. And now, here's Andrew. Welcome to our Thursday's broadcast of the Gospel Truth. Today I'm continuing a series that I've been on for nearly three weeks now talking about the true nature of God. And I tell you, we've covered a lot of material. I can't go back and summarize all of that, but I would encourage you to get our new teaching that I've got out on the true nature of God. I used to have a three-part teaching. Now I've expanded it into a five-part teaching. And I think it's new and improved, and I believe it'll be a real blessing to you. So please take advantage of that offer today. Now, for, on our program yesterday, I was ministering from Romans 5.13, where the Scripture says, For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed where there is no, when there is no law. And so that verse is saying that from the fall of Adam and Eve until the time the law was given to Moses, that's nearly 2,000 years. During that period of time, God was not imputing. That means holding people's sins against them or dealing with them according to their sins. Now that's not the impression that most of us have. I know that I was raised with the impression that the moment Adam and Eve sinned, here's holy God an unholy man, and God drove Adam and Eve out of the garden in punishment and in rejection. And yet, how does that fit with Romans 5.13? And it says, until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. God wasn't imputing Adam and Eve's sins unto them. Well, somebody said, well, then why did he drive them out of the garden? Well, on our program yesterday, I was sharing that I believe it's because of love. <coughs> And some people say, well, what was lovely about driving them out of paradise and making them go out to where now they had to deal with all of these hurts and pains and all of this? Well, the reason it was an act of love, it says in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 22, the Lord said, Now lest he put forth his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore the Lord God sent him forth. God saw that now that corruption had entered into the world, it would have been terrible for man to live forever in this physical body in a fallen world subject to all of the hatred, the anger, the crime, the bitterness, the sickness, the disease, the deformity, mental illness, all of the things. Just imagine everything that any person has ever experienced and there was no escape from it through death. Now, if all we did was just die... You know what? That would even be better than living forever. Living for a hundred thousand years. Just imagine that. With sickness and disease and wars and hatred. And you couldn't ever purge the earth of these people. You couldn't take a serial killer and execute them and get rid of them. The uh, sex offenders and all of the terrible things. What if sin just continued to multiply and there was no restraint? You couldn't stomp it out. You could never die. You could never escape. If all you did was die and go nowhere, death would be better than living forever in a fallen state like that. But when you add to the mix the fact that God has purchased for us something so much greater so that we're going to have a glorified body and we're going to live forever in eternity in, in uh, heaven in the presence of God. When you add that to it, did you know that death is actually a very positive thing? It's a way of escaping this life, entering into a new world where everything that is wrong with this one is going to be fixed. And so God had a better plan than man living forever in this sinful world. And that's the reason that he drove them out of the Garden of Eden. He wasn't doing it out of anger. He didn't do it because he hated them and he broke off fellowship with man. Because you can see in the fourth chapter of the book of Genesis, you can see that God was still walking and talking with man. He was still in communion with man. Now again, if you believe that God got so ticked off that immediately he broke fellowship with man and man was out on his own, well then you're going to have trouble with Genesis chapter 4. Because in Genesis chapter 4, we see a closeness 
and an intimacy between God and man that is very, very close, very similar to what was going on in the Garden of Eden before he expelled them from there. Now again, I know that this is not the paradigm that people have, but this is what the Bible is teaching. I challenge you as you read these scriptures to use your brain for something besides a hat rack, and I believe that you can see this. Amen. In Genesis chapter 4 verse 1, it says, And Adam knew his wife, and she conceived and bare Cain, and said, I have gotten a man from the Lord. And she again bare his brother Abel, and Abel was a keeper of sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. And in the process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. And Abel, he also brought of the firstlings of his flock and of the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering, but unto Cain and his offering he had not respect. And Cain was very wroth, and his countenance fell. Now again, think as you read these passages of Scripture. These people didn't have a Bible. These people hadn't been brought up in religion and things like that. How did they know that you were supposed to bring an offering to the Lord? Now think about that. There isn't anything in Scripture where God told people to offer sacrifices. Now some people would say, well, in Genesis chapter 3, when Adam and Eve had sinned and they had made themselves fig leaves, sewed them together to try and cover their nakedness, God killed an animal and out of those skins made clothes for them. And so symbolically, in type, they saw that there had to be the shedding of blood, in a sense, a sacrifice to cover their nakedness. Well, now, I admit that that symbolism is there, but you know what? That's a little obscure. If I would have been Adam and Eve, I'm not sure that I would have picked up on that symbolism and from that have deduced that I was supposed to be offering sacrifices and doing all of those things. And even if you say that that's where they got this knowledge of sacrifice, that doesn't explain about Cain bringing of the first fruits of his ground and offering them as a sacrifice to the Lord. That wasn't revealed that you were supposed to bring the first fruits of your crops unto the Lord until the time that Moses gave the law, somewhere around Leviticus chapter 20, 25, somewhere around in there. It talks about all of these things. And so, where did they get this knowledge? Well, the logical assumption would be that God told them, that God was still talking and communicating with mankind. And they didn't have a born-again spirit so that they could hear God speak to them in their inner man. It, it, it looks apparently that God was just speaking to them, that they were hearing the audible voice of God very similar to the way that they heard the voice of God when they were still in the garden. Here's another thing that you need to think about. How did this... This passage of Scripture says that God had respect unto... Uh, Abel and to his offering, but unto Cain and his offering he had not respect. How did the Lord show this respect? How did he show the approval of Abel's offering over Cain's? Again, most people just read this and they don't think about this. How did they show this? Well, the scripture doesn't make it clear, but in this passage of scripture, it is very clear that God was talking to Cain in an audible voice. And so it would lend itself. It would be the logical thing to assume that if this is how he communicated with Cain, that he was probably somehow or another still communicating with them and telling them that I'm pleased with this offering, I'm displeased with this offering. God was still communicating with people in an audible voice in some way, in some degree, very, very similar to the way that he was dealing with them prior to the sin of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. And see, this bears out that scripture in Romans 5.13 that until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. Now see, again, if you're listening, this should change your impression about the nature of God. Most people believe that God was so holy so straight, so strict that the moment Adam and Eve sinned, the wrath, the anger of God fell and God ran Adam and Eve out of his presence because he couldn't have anything to do with them. Romans 5.13 says, Until the time of the law, God was not imputing man's trespasses unto them. It shows us a different picture than what most of us have accepted. And what I'm beginning to show you is scriptural examples 
that God drove Adam and Eve out of the garden out of mercy and out of love because he didn't want them living forever in that fallen state. He was still walking and talking with them. He communicated to them about sacrifices. He showed the acceptance of Abel's offering and the rejection of Cain's offering apparently in some either visible or audible form. He was still talking with men. And then look what happened. It said in verse uh, 6, this is Genesis 4, 6, And the Lord said unto Cain, Why art thou wroth, and why is thy countenance fallen? If thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted? And if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door, and unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. Now again, how did the Lord say this to Cain? The scripture doesn't make it clear, but it seems obvious to me. I think if you read this without any prejudice or bias, you'd have to say that it's very similar to the way that he was talking to Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. They heard the voice of the Lord. They heard this audible voice. Here is an audible voice from God talking to Cain. What is the difference between that and when they were in the Garden of Eden? There might have been some difference. It may not have had the same frequency because of the corruption of man's heart. Maybe it didn't have the same benefit or blessing to them. I don't know. But basically it's the same thing. God was still walking and talking with man. And this bears out the scripture that until the time that the law was given, God was not imputing man's trespasses unto them. He was still being merciful unto man's trespasses. I tell you, this is radically different. And this is showing a different nature of God than what many of us have thought. Instead of God being this harsh person that has a short fuse, and that if we transgress, the wrath of God is going to fall. Instead, this is the mercy of God being manifest. And it shows the nature and character of God as being mercy. So how was it that Cain and Abel knew to offer sacrifices unto God. How did, they, how did God show his acceptance of Abel's offering and rejection of Cain's offering? How is it that God spoke unto Cain and told him these things about if he'd do well, God would bless him. If he didn't do well, send, send light at the door. How did those things happen? Well, it looked by the context that it was God walking and talking and still communicating with Cain and Abel the way that he had their parents, Adam and Eve, in the Garden of Eden. And this bears out Romans 5, 13, that until the law, sin was in the world, but sin isn't imputed where there is no law. God wasn't rejecting them. He didn't cut mankind off from him and just uh, refuse to have any dealings with them. He was still walking and talking with Cain and Abel the way that he had talked with, his, with their parents, Adam and Eve. Oh, that is a radical concept right there, and it changes your impression of God in the way that he's dealt with mankind. And then look at this. It says in verse 8, this is Genesis 4, 8, And Cain talked with Abel his brother, and it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel his brother and slew him. And the Lord said unto Cain, Where is Abel thy brother? And he said, I know not. Am I my brother's keeper? <clears throat> Now again, I believe that this has to be talking about that God spoke to them in an audible voice because they weren't born again. They couldn't hear God speak on the inside the way that we as New Testament believers can. There is every, everything in these passages of Scripture points to the fact that God spoke this in an audible voice. Now let me ask you this. If you had just murdered somebody... And if you had, say, a knife in your hand, the blood was still on the knife. And if you had just killed somebody, and if an audible voice out of heaven came and says, What have you done? How many of you would just stick the knife behind your back and lie directly to this audible voice from God coming out of heaven and say, I didn't do anything. I haven't done anything. You know, you couldn't even imagine that happening. If you had just killed somebody... Now, Take this into account, too, that we have been so corrupted. We've been exposed to levels of sin that Cain never knew about. I've heard it said that the average child, by the time they reach 18 years of age, has seen in excess 
of 200,000 brutal murders on television and movies. And what that does, that tends to harden our heart and desensitize us. But here is the first murderer on the face of the earth. No one had ever killed before. They had never seen a dead person before. Nobody knew what death was. Here is the first time that anybody had ever killed another person. And while he still had the blood on his hands, an audible voice from heaven says, What have you done? Where is Abel your brother? You know, that, that's amazing. If that was to happen to you, and if you had blood still on your hands and an audible voice from God came and said, What have you done? They wouldn't have to prosecute you. They just have to pick you up and take you to the morgue because you'd die. If you heard an audible voice out of heaven saying, what have you done? You'd just fall over dead right there. I guarantee you, the very reaction of Cain to where he just, you know, it, if he had a rock in his hand or whatever, he puts it behind his back and he says, I don't know where Abel is. Am I my brother's keeper? And he just lies to God. You know what this says? This says volumes. It says that he was so used to the audible voice of God that it didn't scare him, it didn't terrorize him. As the old saying goes, familiarity breeds contempt. The very fact that Cain heard an audible voice out of heaven speak to him and he just lied to God shows that he was so familiar to hearing this audible voice from God that it wasn't strange, it wasn't unusual to him. Now, if you would think when you read these scriptures, I believe you'd have to come to these conclusions that I am. God was still walking and talking with them. He communicated with them, told them about sacrifices, told Cain about bringing the first fruits of his ground and offering those things. He spoke to them and showed acceptance of Abel's sacrifice, rejection of Cain's sacrifice. He spoke to Cain and gave him some promises. And then when Cain murdered his brother, the audible voice of God came and Cain was able to just turn around and reject God and lie directly to God showing that he was so familiar with the audible voice of God that it didn't cause any reverence or fear in his life. It wasn't a strange or unusual occurrence. All of these things, I believe, have to be true if you read this and think about it. And what this is doing is showing that God was still walking and talking with man. He was still fellowshipping with them, that their location had changed. He drove them out of the Garden of Eden because he didn't want them eating of the tree of life and living forever in that sinful state. But God hadn't forsaken mankind. God was still being merciful unto mankind. He was still walking and talking with them, communicating with them. God didn't drive man out of his presence. <clears throat> what actually happened was man left the presence of God. And you can see that right down here in Genesis chapter 4 and in verse 16 it says, And Cain went out from the presence of the Lord and dwelt in the land of Nod on the east of Eden. Cain left the presence of the Lord. God didn't drive Cain away from him. Cain left. When Cain saw how he had displeased the Lord, when he saw the uh, depths of his sin. He ran away from God. He rejected God. God did not reject him. Boy, now those are radical, radical statements. And you know the reason I'm sharing these things? We're talking about the true nature of God. Most people think that God just is this angry, harsh, I mean hard to please God. I actually had a man describe God one time as leaning over a banister of heaven with a lightning bolt in his hand just waiting on him to get out of line and God would strike him dead. And you know what? There's a lot of people with a similar type of impression. This is showing us that for the first 2,000 years after the fall until the time that Moses came, here were people living in sin and yet God was still walking and talking with them. He hadn't rejected them. There was very little difference, if any, in the way that God was dealing with mankind because according to Romans 5.13, he was not imputing their trespasses unto them. But when the law came, 
everything changed. And God did begin to start imputing man's trespasses unto them. He became very harsh on sin. And this is the impression of God that most of us have gotten. Most of us have gotten the God of the Old Testament law. And that is the impression of God that we've seen. And even though it wasn't inaccurate, it was incomplete. And therefore gave an inaccurate impression of God. And many of us have seen God as this harsh, judgmental God. And yet, I'm going to show you a lot more scriptures that shows you God being merciful unto people up until the time of Moses. And then during the time of Jesus... Jesus was merciful to people in a way that the Old Testament law would not allow. And if Jesus hadn't have just operated in a superior wisdom and had been able to out-talk the scribes and the Pharisees, they would have killed him on the basis of breaking the law. They tried many times to trap him, and yet he would always turn it around. But that's really what infuriated them, because Jesus was giving an impression of God, showing a nature, a side of God, that the Old Testament law didn't show. And the Old Testament legalists, these scribes and Pharisees, therefore were offended and hated Jesus because he was presenting God as a loving, kind, heavenly father. He referred to God as father, which was a concept that was hated and not uh, understood and appreciated in the Old Testament. And so that's the reason they rejected Jesus. Did you know Jesus would also be rejected by the legalistic Christians of today? He really would. And some people can't see that, but it's absolutely true. And so what I'm doing is showing you that God dealt with mankind in mercy. Now look at this in Genesis chapter 4. How did he deal with the very first murderer on the face of the earth? Cain. Well, he told Cain that because you've done this, the earth isn't going to bring its strength unto you. You're going to eat your bread under all of these sorrows and grief and things like this. There were consequences to his sin. Don't misinterpret what I'm saying as saying that I don't believe that there's any consequences that you can just go live in sin and it doesn't hurt you. Sin will cost you more than you want to pay, keep you longer than you want to stay. Sin is not good. There are consequences, but I'm saying that God didn't bring his judgment upon this man's sin. Instead, Cain said this unto the Lord in verse 13. This is Genesis 4, 13. Cain said unto the Lord, My punishment is greater than I can bear. Behold, thou hast driven me out this day from the face of the earth, and from, the, and from my face shall I be hid, and I shall be a fugitive and a vagabond in the earth, and it shall come to pass that every one that findeth me shall slay me. And the Lord said unto him, Therefore, whosoever slayeth Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord set a mark upon Cain, lest any finding him should kill him. What did the Lord do to the first murderer on the face of the earth? He rebuked him. He reproved him. He gave him some consequences to his sin, but he didn't vent his wrath on him. Instead, when Cain said, Man, everybody who finds out what I've done, they're going to seek to kill me. God actually put a mark on Cain and said that if anybody touches him, I'll avenge the death of Cain sevenfold. He protected the first murderer on the face of the earth. And even though there were consequences, he didn't vent the fullness of his wrath. In contrast to this, the very first person who broke the Old Testament law picked up sticks to make a fire and to cook some food. And God said, kill him. Can you tell that there's a difference between the Old Testament law and the grace of God? Man, we're out of time today, but I'm going to share this again on our program tomorrow. And I think we're getting into some things here that could really change your impression about the true nature of God.